Hi everybody, I'm Andrew Land from SSW TV and we're at NDC Sydney. Today I'm going to be doing an AMA session with Philip W. Hello. So, do you want to tell everyone why you're here and what you've been presenting? Yeah, so I've, I've, I've done two sessions. Um, I've done two sessions, one on Wednesday, one today. And I was speaking about uh, C-sharp development, uh, interactive C-sharp development. This is the session that I did today. And also about C-sharp scripting, which is the thing that I'm really passionate about because this is uh, something that I've dedicated countless hours of my open source contributions over the past several years. And this is the session that I did on, uh, on Wednesday. And, uh, and I, I flew in here, so I'm not from here, as you can hear from my wonderful accent. Mm. I flew in here from Switzerland. So, so that's the story. And, and, and it's, been, it's been great. And today is my last day because I fly out tomorrow. So I'm really happy to be here with you mm. right now. Uh, so what's the sort of work you're doing in Switzerland? Are you with mm -hmm. a local company there or? Yeah, exactly. So I'm with a local company, I'm with a kind of global company, but I'm based in Switzerland. So I work for a company called Sonova. So mm -hmm. this, is, this is a medical company. It's the biggest, uh, the biggest hearing aid manufacturer in the world. And my official job title is, uh, is uh, Tech Lead Cloud Services. And that really is just a code name for a lot of Azure and a lot of web stuff. So I work mainly with ASP.NET Core, but also with some other technologies. A lot of Docker, you know, a lot of, a lot of cool things that I try to bring there so that the work is not too boring for anybody. Yeah. yeah. And so you've mentioned that you're very much into the open source uh, area. Yes. Uh, is that kind of spurred on by why you're interested in working at a hearing aid company that's kind of community helpful yeah exactly kind of <laughs> that's the, a great the societal aspect yes, of it is I, more important exactly. this is a great question actually because i've never thought about it like this and this is how i'm gonna <laughs> this, uh, this is what i'm gonna be telling people now because <laughs> the, the way you spun it is actually perfect so i've never thought about it this way to be honest but but it works out quite nicely so um the reason why i work for a company that i work for uh, is is kind of also caused by the fact that in the past I used to be a consultant. So mm -hmm. I was kind of, you know, m uh, moving around the world quite a lot. I was working for, you know, whoever came with 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 the project and with money. And and uh, and that's great because you learn a lot of things. You learn a lot of new situations. You meet a lot of people. But at some point, it the stability is just not there. So I was looking for some stability. I found a company, and the bonus was, of course, that this is not, you know, a company that is I don't know selling cigarettes or something, you know, yeah. uh, it is uh, actually a company that is doing some good. So from that perspective, absolutely, it's there. But to your point, to your question, is uh, about open source. Yes, so this is a big, big part of my life. I'm really passionate about open source. I spent a lot of, a lot of hours contributing to open source. Uh, I pretty much have no hobbies. I have very <laughs> few friends. I probably have no friends, probably, <laughs> I can say that. Uh, so all of my free time goes towards uh, towards open source, almost. Yeah. Oh, m maybe not all of it because I have a wife, so this <laughs> the, the she gets some time as well. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Well, do you find the uh, the distributed kind of communities that form around these open source projects? Do you consider that like the friendships yeah. and the networks yeah. that you're making in that yeah. free time, yeah. and yeah. it's kind of comparable mm -hmm. to what you'd expect, mm -hmm. or is it a different yeah. experience? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this is quite amazing, actually. Uh, because you get to interact with people who you normally have no chance interacting with, you know, some some of the most brilliant minds in in in, in the technology in which you are working with, mm. uh, you can meet those people virtually online and and you can work with them on on projects and 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 you know the, you can get them to do code reviews at some point for you. Those are those are things that are just unimaginable, I would say. And, and, and so this is, this is a big aspect of open source. And, and I got to meet a lot of amazing people thanks to open source and thanks to those online encounters. Mm. And uh, yeah, that absolutely helped me, helped me grow as a developer as well, yes. And, 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 and the thing about open source is that, you know, sometimes you have, you have no idea who's on the other side, you know, maybe you don't even know the name of the person, you just know the, the screen name, the username. Yeah. And it's this amazing, it's an amazing person that just shows up and it's ten times smarter than you, and just helping you through different issues, and 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 yeah. So those types of of, of, of things are are what draws me to open source. I think. Right. Yeah. So when did you first get involved in open source? What was the first project that kind of kicked it off? Uh, that's a good question. I yeah. The first like 
serious serious project i think that uh, that that i built was was script cs project i did it with glenn block who was mm -hmm. at microsoft at that time and he just reached out to me and he said okay i saw some of your blog posts and some of the ideas that you have in those blo blog posts let's let's put them into a, a project and let's build it for people and this is how it started so i think this was the first serious one there were some smaller things because you know how this like uh, especially when you're starting yeah. Uh, maybe you don't have a clear idea of what you are trying to build because ultimately, I mean, open source is like building products, right? It's not like you immediately have this million dollar idea and this is going to be the project that I'm going to do and everybody in the .NET community is going to use this, right? It's, it mm. doesn't work like that. So there were things that I would put up online and, and mm, very often it would be some sort of um, a code that accompanies a blog post that illustrates something. But the first, I think, real project was the script CS project, so the, 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 the C-sharp scripting project that really was really successful uh, uh, after, after a while, yeah. yeah. It was partly also because of Glenn. I mean, he's a, he's a big figure in the .NET community. So, so this, is, I mean, this is also a great example. So he's now a very, very good friend of mine. I've been to his house and you know, I, I, I've, I've spent a lot of time with him. And we, we literally just met, you know, because he messaged me randomly on the internet saying, hey, let's build an open source project together. Yeah, and this is how it starts, and and so th this is fantastic. Yeah, right. This is so, do you reckon that the the open source projects that get big and more reputable are the ones that are kind of started by the smarter people off at those big companies, or are they just the ones that attract the attention of those people? Because they're usually the figureheads who are promoting it. Yeah. Uh, well, <coughs> to be honest, I, I'm I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Uh, I've never thought about this. Maybe. I mean, surely, of course, if you have kind of more prominent people involved, you get a, a larger platform straight up to, to, um, to communicate things about your project and so on. Mm. But I think it's all about also the timing, right? I think yeah. it's all about that. Uh, you, you need to be a bit lucky as well with how things work out. Uh, but yeah, I think I, I don't think there is a rule of thumb here. Yeah. I think uh, yeah, it depends. It really depends. So with all the projects you've looked at and worked on, how many of them do you find start to grow and thrive and how many start to kind of dwindle away or just stagnate? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. That is a great question. So uh, again, it depends, but, but the observation that you have is, 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 is really good because there are some projects that, that reach a state where you just say, okay, it's, it's done. Right, mm. like it's done. There's no more features that should be added here as a as a project. This is finished, and mm. uh, and uh, in a way, this has this has happened um, uh, to Script CS, where it reached a point where probably the feature level has been saturated, and we considered it almost like done. Now the landscape in .NET has changed. So there is .NET Core and there are other things uh, that you know the Roslyn compiler is fully cross-platform, for example, and so on. So this has like kicked a new life into that particular project, but there are other projects. So for example, I built a, an open source project that was also quite popular. Uh, it was a, an output cache for ASP.NET Web API, right? So ASP.NET mm. Web API, it shipped without any caching uh, capabilities and people were used to having output cache in MVC, for example, right? So I built yeah. an output cache for Web API and, and this was a project that was actually quite popular. And uh, I mean, it was not, you know, JSON.NET popular, but it had, quite a lot of downloads and um, and so that project for example in, in a way it, it, it kind of died because ASP.NET Web API is not something that I mean you really want to invest in anymore right yeah maybe there are some projects that are still using it but that product is, 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 is done by Microsoft nobody maybe, maybe there are some little patches here and there and that's it right so from mm. that perspective I kind of stopped investing that much time I'm gonna what I'm going to do um, around this project, I'm going to come in every couple of months and, okay, maybe do a little fix here, a little fix there, and, yeah. and so on, right? So it, 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 it also it depends, but, but the question is, is correct. So they, they have, the, the projects, they have different uh, life cycles, for sure. Right. For sure. And you mentioned Roslyn. Yes. So that came out how many years ago now? So the first preview of Roslyn was 2011. Mm-hmm. 
but uh, RTM of Roslyn was two years ago, right, with VS 2015. Yeah, and so how do you think that's influenced the kind of landscape and opportunities for projects yeah, utilizing I, it? Yeah, I think it changed the game a lot. Uh, in fact, I actually had a, a, a session that I did at a couple of conferences. Mm -hmm. It was called How Roslyn Revitalized .NET Open Source. <laughs> this, this was literally the title of the session. So. Exactly. I, there are countless of open source projects that are built on top of Roslyn these days. Roslyn, because of the openness and, and, and the fact that it gives us the, the, the gives us access to the compiler, right? It's a compiler as a service. Yeah. It allows us to build uh, tools and, and projects around things that were previously just not not there, right? Because the mm. compiler was black box. So from that perspective, even um, we are able to, to create and build up open source projects that, uh, that, that could have never existed before. Yeah. Right? And, um, and another thing is that is, is, uh, Rostin is now cross-platform and also um, Mono, since version 5 of Mono is using Rostlin as a compiler. It doesn't use Mono compiler uh, as well. Yeah. That makes things even easier because now you have the same compiler for literally everything in .NET. So that helps a lot as well. Yeah, so Rostlin's been a, a, a big game changer, I think, in the in the, o in the open source community. In, in fact, in, in the whole .NET, really. And, um, and 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 another thing is that there are also some of the APIs that Rostlin exposes that uh, facilitate building um, uh, little add-ons to the compiler that can be plugged in, for example, into the IDE, into into Visual Studio or maybe um, Visual Studio Code with C# -sharp extension. So those are things that, 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 that typically, like the, the little uh, helper libraries that can help you write code, those were things that were reserved for commercial companies like, yeah. like JetBrains and you know, there was CodeRush and so on. Now mm. anybody can build those little things and, 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 and that's great as well, I think. Yeah, it's been interesting seeing the like, expansive number of code auditors that are now embedded and working properly because Roslyn allows them mm -hmm. to work more effectively mm -hmm. instead of using regex yes. or something like that. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so it's a lot faster yes. in actually giving you more yes. effective information yes. back. Exactly. Uh, and so that kind of tied into one of your more well-known open source projects, which was OmniSharp. Yes. And so that's essentially leveraging all of this power provided by Roslyn to allow uh, .NET to work on any operating system, right? Yeah, exactly. So, so OmniSharp, so so just so that I don't take all the credit, so there is a couple of people involved there, but I'm also helping out whatever I can with the OmniSharp project. Uh, and the idea of, of OmniSharp is that it, it, it takes the capabilities of Roslyn and it, expo it exposes them as, as kind of a, a, a language service protocol, so to speak. And that can be consumed from any editor, right? And mm -hmm. uh, this could be Visual Studio Code. This is the most prominent user or the customer, so to speak, of, of OmniSharp. But there are many others. For example, OmniSharp Emacs is very advanced as well. And if you yeah. want to write C Sharp in Emacs, there is an extension that you know brings in OmniSharp there, and you get really rich language services in Emacs and, and other editors as well, Atom and, and so on. Mm. Right. So this is this is the idea. So to, to because you know the point is that uh, if it's done like this, it's actually all of the knowledge about the compiler and all of this logic is is in the central place. And really to plug in. C sharp language services into an editor. It just comes down to writing a little plugin for the editor that is just communicating with, with this language server, so to speak, right? Yeah. So this type of architecture is the maximum code reuse, right? It's just really the, the, the UI layer, if you will, is different for each editor. Mm. Yeah. And so how did you get involved with that project? Were you approached to join it? Did you just put your hand up and volunteer? So yeah, exactly. If someone else wanted to join, mm -hmm. how easy mm -hmm. would it be yeah. for them to get involved? Yeah, exactly. So. The project was started by uh, by Jason, and I can't pronounce his last name, just like <laughs> nobody can pronounce mine. So I just I'm just gonna call him Jason, Jason yeah. from UK, and 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 so this was a great project, a, a great idea. It's a brilliant idea, right? It all comes down to this. We have this brilliant idea, crazy idea, by the way. I'm gonna mm. just bring in C# -sharp language says to every editor. So he had this idea, and, and he built the original version of OmniSharp, and uh, and I was a little bit involved in that. I sent some pull requests here and there, but I was not on the on the team or anything like that. Yeah. And, uh, and then OmniSharp switched to uh, the Roslyn version. And at that moment, um, um, Jason was still there. And uh, I was involved in a lot of scripting uh, projects like ScriptCS, but also uh, a couple of other things. And I wanted to have 
C sharp language services for scripts, and this is how I so I approached Jason. I said, listen, so this is Omni Sharp, but it doesn't expose anything for scripting, so I can take care of that. And this is how I joined the project. Effectively, started working on this area, just mm. scripting services, right? Yeah. And uh, and since then, a lot has changed, and Jason has left project, and and so on. And there are other people involved, uh, uh, but uh, scripting support is still there. And uh, and my role has expanded a little bit, where I actually I'm involved in a couple of other things as well. Uh, right. Uh, that that is beyond scripting. As well. Yeah. Well, thanks. Uh, this has been very informative, and I'm signing off from SSW TV.